Good morning, small baby humans. Hey, everybody. It's Tuesday. Um, so if you're watching this, that means that you didn't make it to class today for whatever reason. Hope you are well. Hope those around you are well. Um, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to run through a concept that is really important in psychology and in any kind of experimentation or data collection about people, and that's going to be ethics, okay? And what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to run you guys through the, first of all, what is ethics? And then I'm going to take you guys through some of the major rules of ethics in psychology, followed by a couple of um, popular examples from psychology. And we'll talk about whether or not those things are ethical. I'll let you draw some conclusions. I'll run you through the examples. So uh, first of all, updates. Um, don't forget that you have that assignment due Thursday by midnight, the uh, Crash Course uh, Chapter 2, uh, 10 and a half minute long video with I think it's seven or eight questions that go along with it. Uh, that last question is kind of a big deal one, so please put your best effort in on that one. Um, I graded your tests yesterday. I put the test scores in. Um, there are a handful of you guys that still owe me tests. I sent you emails yesterday uh, with the link uh, for the test, so please, if you did not take that, please take it soon. I am going to be sending out a round of parent emails later this week, and um, if your test is missing, you're, you're definitely getting one. Uh, please let me know if you're unsure about things. Uh, so again, today we're going to define ethics. We're going to learn to apply a couple of the principles to some important experiments, and then you're going to have some work time. So um, once you get done watching this, make sure you allot any time you had set aside for psychology uh, to getting that assignment done. Okay? All right. So here we go. So ethics... Let me see, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you. Oh, I just rolled it back. So ethics are basically like a, a set of guidelines for like morality uh, to be really, really general. Um, when I think of ethics, I think of things in personal life like um, a couple summers ago, uh, Caden, not a couple summers, I mean, I suppose it's been about five or six summers ago, Caden, Phoebe, and I went to the zoo. And we were walking around over by where the merry-go-round and the little train are and, um, and you know, kind of seeing stuff that was over there. As we were walking by the little merry-go-round house, uh, Cade bent down and, and picked up $80 off the ground. No one around, you know, things like that. And um, we had a discussion about what the right thing to do was. We could have obviously, you know, could have stuck the money in his pocket. He could have, you know, given me half, taken a half himself. Instead, what we decided to do was we decided to turn the money in to a volunteer in case someone was looking for it. Um, the logic being that, you know, maybe that was some family's money for, you know, the day to, you know, go to the zoo and, and go out to dinner or lunch or something like that. And, and so ethically speaking, I think Cade made the right choice to turn it into the volunteer. Now, what did the volunteer do with it? Did anyone ever pick it up? I, I suppose we'll never know. Um, so there are a number of ethics questions that you are faced with during the day, during the course of a day. If a friend is cheating on work in a class. Do you, you know, do you, do you knowingly let it go on? Do you say something? Do you say something to the teacher? Um, you know, you're, you're involved in tons of relationships where people may or may not talk about other people behind their back or, or do things that are deceitful behind other people's back. Um, and, and so ethics are, are kind of ingrained into everyday life and everybody has their own code for what is okay and what's not. Now in psychology and in science, you, you're really looking at like what is allowable and what is okay in experiments and as far as like with people's information. And so the rules for psychology are set up by the American Psychological Association or the APA. And those rules are detailed, highly detailed. And um, obviously ethics in science are, are important. And when scientists start doing things that are unethical, um, that really calls into question their standing in the scientific community, uh, especially when it comes to testing and the well-being of their subjects, whether they be human or, or animal. Um, now, there are a number of different rules when it comes to ethics and scientific testing. And what I've done is I've pulled out four of kind of the biggies that I think encompass lots of 
lots of different things. And, and so I'm going to focus in on those four, and then I'm going to run you guys through a couple of examples. And so the first one I want to talk about is that subjects have the right to decline participation, or they can withdraw from an experiment whenever they need to. Um, obviously, this is important because, you know, the, you we're going to talk about a kind of study called a naturalistic observation where subjects are observed in their natural environment without their knowing. And I've always questioned whether or not this violates that code right off the bat. And I've always gotten this weird vibe off of um, naturalistic observations that there's something stalkerish, something immoral about them because you're watching people without them being aware of the fact that they're being watched. Um, really the crux of this, the important piece to this is, if you have a subject involved in an experiment and they start to feel uncomfortable or there's a side effect to a medication or something hurts or um, something happens, you can't say, well, you started the study and you're gonna invalidate my research if you, if you walk away. They have to be allowed to walk away. Um, people have to be allowed to say no and be done. Now, oftentimes in experiments, um, you know, if you're taking like you're doing a Covance clinical research experiment on a medication, there, there's usually a monetary um, reward for being a subject in those things. Uh, obviously, they can forfeit the right to pay you in full and things like that. But um, obviously, the, the subject must be allowed to quit. Second, um, openness and honesty are essential. Now, what I mean by that is you don't have to say um, here, we're doing an experiment on peaches and we're hoping peaches help uh, clear up your skin. You don't have to tell them that. You don't have to be like, the experiment is peaches and we're giving you peaches, so please take good care of yourself. But you, you do need to talk about the process. You need to alert them if there were any side effects that have popped up in any other situations. You need to let them know if there's any any risk involved and um, if there's any potential, you know, potential harm that could come from being involved in this. So obviously, like people that have been involved, and this isn't necessarily a psychological study, the, the COVID vaccine studies, I think they've explained to those people that, listen, this is an experimental drug. Um, we don't know exactly, you know, the goal, obviously the goal is to, is to be able to make people immune or get their antibodies up to the coronavirus um, overall. But, you know, and this is an experimental drug and there could be side effects. We want you to monitor those things um, and we will take care of anything that pops up along the way. All right. So, so openness and honesty are, are essential. Uh, last or second to last, uh, information obtained is confidential. Uh, meaning that in, in the medical world, your doctor can't run out and go, oh, my God, I, I saw this guy today and his name was blah, 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 blah. And he had the worst case of Ugh, I've ever seen and, you know, whatever. Um, people's, people's right to their privacy is protected by a number of different things. In the medical world, it's something called HIPAA codes or HIPAA laws. Um, in psychology, you know, similar types of things. So if we took an IQ test, um, Waterloo kids and Marshall kids took an IQ test. I, I have a hypothesis that Marshall kids will score higher on an IQ test than Waterloo kids. And um, let's say the average Marshall kid is five points higher on an IQ test, but there's a Marshall kid who scores the lowest score. I can't go to the courier and, and publish my results and, and name people. This person had the highest score, this person had the lowest score. That, that's against confidentiality. And so that extends to like therapists, um, you know, unless someone is someone is potential in potential danger, uh, they have the, they have a moral code that says that they can't, you know, can't give away information about their clients. Um, obviously, in, in schools, there's an ethical code in dealing with you know student behavior and student information. Um, the exception to that being like uh, mandatory reporter laws that that make it where if a uh, student is in harm, uh, the teacher. You know, just, you know, those things. Often in psychology, when psychologists write books, they change people's names. Uh, they change people's locations and, and, and things a little bit to hide the identity of the person that they're writing about. Last but not least, uh, the experimenter has to assess the risk uh, involved in the experiment. They have to inform the subject of any danger, and they have to attempt to remove the danger. And so if we're doing, I'm going to use another drug study, if we're doing a drug study and the drug is prone to cause people to have, I don't know, uh, terrible asthma attacks, which cause, um, you know, such a lack of oxygen to come into the body. Uh, oftentimes what happens in situations like that is the, the drug group pumps the brakes on the, the experiment itself. They try to rectify, figure out what's going on. And if they can remove the danger from that, they do. Um, if there was something in an experiment, let's say we're, we're testing about how um, stress affects memory. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to give you a list of items to memorize. And um, we're going to ask you to tell us back things on listen. Every time you don't remember something or you get an item wrong, we shock you. We put a little little electrode on your finger and we shock you. But partway through the test, we realize that the electrode is warming up to the point that it's actually um, burning the skin. It's actually causing like blisters to form. Uh, we'll, we'll stop the experiment. We will work on a better setup or a different location that maybe will, will not blister. Um, we're also going to obviously medically take care of you in that situation. So those are, are just some. There, there are a lot more. If you go into a psychology-related field, you'll realize that, you know, if you become a therapist, there's a set of ethical rules for therapists. If you go into the scientific part of things and you're running experiments, there's going to be a completely different set of, of rules. But they're all going to basically, I think, in the end, come back down to these four. Um, now... Some, some famous examples from psychology, and I'm going to run you through them, and I'm going to let you make your decision about whether or not this is ethical. Okay, is this, was this study ethical? Whoop, I apparently stuck a blank slide in there. Okay, we're going to just drop that down someplace. All right, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Please stand by. Old guy working the tech. All right, so a case to consider. Um, this is called the Little Albert Experiment. Uh, in the late teens, early 1920s, uh, there was a psychologist named John B. Watson. John B. Watson was a behaviorist. He, um, that means that he was thought that you were a product of what you learned, and that also he only wanted to measure observable behavior. And in 1920, he decided to build on the uh, classical conditioning work of Ivan Pavlov. If you don't know anything about Ivan Pavlov, we're going to talk about him in Psych 2. Um, but Pavlov basically believed that you could you could call, you could force people to associate things together. Um, Pavlov's experiment, it's associating the, the sound of a bell or a white lab coat with being fed, okay? And so dogs would, would drool. Now, in this case, what Watson wanted to know is could he condition or teach someone to have a phobia who didn't prior to that have any phobias? And so what he did is he worked with an 11-month-old kid named Albert. That's probably not the kid's actual name, um, but there's, there's a couple different versions of this story, but, but basically what the, the crux of the experiment is, is Albert was an 11 month old baby. They did some baseline testing on Albert where they exposed him to a rabbit, which you can see in that picture, a white rat, a dog, um, some different things like, like flames. Obviously they didn't want to hold the flame, but there were a lot of different things and they, they tested him to see if he had any prior fears to anything. And it turned out that, you know, he's a lovable little baby. He's probably not afraid of much of anything unless it physically hurts him. And they figured out, according to a lot of what I read, that Albert was most comfortable with this, this little white rat or this rabbit. And so what they did was when Albert would come in to play, and this is, this is done in a hospital that Watson worked at, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not Albert's mom knew that, that this was happening or whether or not she knew but felt like she couldn't do anything to stop it. And so what they did, though, was they, they would let Albert play with these animals for a little bit. He was happy. He would smile. I mean, obviously, in that picture, he's not smiling. We'll, we'll get to why in a minute. But what they did after a little while is when Albert would be playing with the animal, they would come up with a crowbar or a piece of metal behind Albert, and they would hit it with a hammer and make really loud noises that would scare, scare Albert and make him cry. So when he would reach for the, for the thing that he liked, they would, they would beat this thing and scare him and make him cry. Eventually, and I don't think this is going to be a great surprise to anybody, Albert started to associate the, the rabbit and the rat with the loud, scary noise. And so when he would see the rat and the rabbit, he would start crying. Now, there's a lot more that goes into this. We'll talk more about this later in the year. Um, but eventually the mother removed Albert from the situation. There's a lot of stories about what happened to Albert later. Again, I want to, I want to be able to talk about this more in detail when it, when it fits into more into our, our stuff when we do learning. So I want you to think about this. Did they, did they violate any ethical rules? And, and if so, which, which ones are the ethical rules? And, and, and honestly, did they, did they do anything they shouldn't have just, just shouldn't have done? So my take on the whole thing is this. I, it, whether or not Albert's mom knew, obviously, is very important. If Albert's mom gave permission for them to do this experiment on the kid, <clears throat> obviously, that, that changes things a little bit. Uh, one version of the story says that she did not know. Um, most versions say that she had some knowledge but, but felt stuck. So I, I'm going to say it probably did violate some ethical rules because I think that there's that whole... And there's that whole, like, you have the right to decline. And it's not exactly like an 11th-month-old baby has the right to say no. And it seems like the mother was kind of 
I don't, I don't want to say forced, but kind of put in a tough situation. Um, as far as risk, you know, obviously there's a risk of some trauma. Uh, you know, we don't really know how Albert turned out, and, and therefore, you know, what you know, Fedemanic had a terrible phobia and needed therapy. Theoretically, John Watson and his associates should have had to have paid for all that. I don't think that happened. Um, was there a risk, danger? I don't necessarily think so. They weren't, they weren't hurting the kid. Um, it, confidentiality, the kid's name wasn't, wasn't Albert. They, they kept the mother's name secret. And that's why we have a hard time tracking down some of the backstory. All right, uh, the next one, last one. Um, what about this one? Uh, the 1973 Stanford prisoner guard experiment that was run by Philip Zimbardo. Um, now, what Zimbardo did is he was looking into um, a bunch of different ideas, but one of the things we're going to talk about is reference grouping. Um, how fast do people adopt the ideas of a group and understand their roles in that group? And he wanted to also look at how, like, how aggressiveness develops among prison guards, not to mention a lot of other things. And so what he did was, um, whoops, they built a a prison, like holding cells and things, in the basement of a Stanford University building, and they interviewed. They had 24 prisoners, and you were going to have 12 mock prisoners and, and 12 mock guards. Um, the prisoners were very much treated like regular prisoners. They were arrested at their homes. They were booked and fingerprinted, and all those things. Um, then they were. They had a bag placed over their head, and they were taken to this this prison. Okay. Um, when they got to the prison, they were stripped down naked, they were searched, they were given a prison jumpsuit with a number only on it and um, a, a thing, to, uh, like a cap to cover their hair and a, a basic pair of shoes, a mattress in a room and things like that. The guards were given like khaki uniforms, they were given a whistle and they were given a baton. I, I, when I say baton, it looks a little bit less baton-y in that picture. It's more like a bat to me. Um, and then they were basically held to prison rules. Um, at about 2.30 in the morning on the first night, the prisoner or the guards woke the prisoners up and had them do a roll call where they referred to themselves only as their numbers. The guards wore glasses all the time, so there wasn't eye contact made. Um, they were forced, the prisoners were forced to do physical punishments. Uh, sometimes there was some abuse involved in that, uh, depending on which versions of the film you get to see. Um, the prisoners became extremely... Some of them became very docile, they listened, and some of them became very upset. As a matter of fact, some of the prisoners um, locked themselves in their room and more or less boarded them, not boarded, but but kind of got themselves inside to the point that the prison guards uh, got fire uh, fire extinguishers and used the fire extinguishers to, you know, get inside the rooms, but then spray the the guard or the prisoners so they could get in there. Um, the The... In total, the experiment was supposed to last 14 days. It only lasted six because some of the prisoners started to break down and suffer from mental and emotional trauma. Was this ethical? So I want you to think about that one because we're going to talk about this one again later in the year. And I want you to think about the ethics of this. And if you were an outsider and you were looking at this, would you be like, that's okay? All right. Would, would you would you evaluate this as okay? All right. Well, I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, don't forget to work on your crash course thing if you haven't got that done yet. Uh, please contact me if you have any questions about anything, and I uh, hope you're well. I will see you soon.